I invite you to turn in your Bible this morning to 2 Peter chapter 3, where we want to continue our study in Peter's second epistle, in which Peter is speaking about future events, the coming day of the Lord, and today we want to look at the day of God. We'll be looking, I ask you to follow along as I read verses 10 through 13 of 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look into your word, we acknowledge, as Peter did, that there are some things in your word that are difficult and hard to be understood, but you have revealed these things to us because you want believers to know what you have done and what you are yet going to do, for you are the God who works all things according to the counsel of your holy will. And Father, we are living in a time, though it has been a long time, dispensation of grace, a time where the gospel has been going forward, yet this, even this age, as all others have, will come to a close, and you will return your focus once again to the nation of Israel and to also repay those who rebel against you and the glorious salvation you have provided in your Son, Jesus Christ. There is a day of God. There's also a time of Jacob's trouble. Father, help us as we look at your word to understand these truths according to the truth of your word, to rightly divide your word, and also, Father, to live in a way that is appropriate because you have told us what you are going to do. Lord, we look to you now with thanksgiving as we study your word. Bless and encourage each heart with your truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have seen together that the day of the Lord is going to come. And the day of the Lord is a day of God's judgment, a day of vengeance. God is going to bring his vengeance upon sinners and upon those wicked who rebel against him. This ought to be an encouragement to the believing heart who is looking and thirsting for righteousness. But not only should it be an encouragement, even more importantly, as we saw last week, the fact that the day of the Lord is going to come should be a motivation, we see in verse 11, to live a life that is in all holy behavior and in all godliness as we saw last week. And so it should motivate us. What quality of life are you living? If you're an unbeliever, the word of God says you're living according to the desires of your flesh and you need to receive Jesus Christ as your savior. He died for you. He died on a cross and shed his blood to pay for your sins so that you can receive him as your savior and find the righteousness of God, the salvation of God, the power of God, and the protection of God in your life as you look to him in faith day by day as a believer in Jesus Christ. The word of God reveals Jesus is coming again. He is coming again to bring the righteous wrath of God upon all ungodliness and wickedness of men. The day of the Lord will come. And in verse 10, Peter tells us, the Spirit of God wants us to know, it will come as a thief in the night. That is, for those who are not watching, it will surprise them. It will come upon them suddenly, and it will devastate them. It's not a thief in the night for those who are watching. Jesus said, watch, for you know not the day and the hour that your Lord returns. And so it will come as a thief in the night to those who are not looking for it, 
for those who are expecting it. Now verse 12, we want to face, uh, look at, turn our attention to verse 12 and 13, because as believers, we are to be looking for and hastening the coming day of God. Peter uses a different term here, the Spirit of God, wants us to understand the day of God, and we'll identify that. It's identified here in the verse because it uses the word because of which, because of which, because of the day of God, then the events of the passing away of this former heavens right now and earth, because there's a new heavens and a new earth proclaimed, promised uh, by God, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So this first heaven and earth, this one is going to pass away and is going to pass away with a marvelous heat and noise and a destruction uh, changing the whole fabric of this earth and I believe the atmosphere and even what we call outer space, the first and the second heavens, all of it, so that there will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And we're to be looking for the day of God because of which all the destruction of the first heavens and earth will take place. What is the day of God? Well, the day of God, we'll look at it in just a moment. First of all, I want you to notice we are to be watching and we are to be hastening the day of God in verse 12. Let us deal with this watching. The idea here of looking is watching. Same concept. It's an expectation. We are to be looking for and expecting the day of God. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, please. Fresh in Peter's mind would be the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples when he was on the Mount of Olives and they were looking across west into the city of Jerusalem in the first century. And Jesus told them that all of Jerusalem would be laid waste. And it was in 70 AD by the Romans. And Jesus told them the destruction that would take place and, uh, and, and they just couldn't believe it. But Jesus told them that these things would happen. And Jesus also spoke of a coming day when it would also be a time when Israel would know unbelievable judgment, the like of which, likes of which have not yet happened. Because Jesus also spoke of cosmic disturbances, the sun being disturbed, the light of it being darkened, the stars falling. Think of stars. We think of shooting stars, meteors, asteroids, things like this. And, uh, and isn't it interesting when you watch the news every once in a while or read the news, however you get your news, if you get your news, they are always concerned about the next big asteroid and how close it came to Earth. The Lord said he's going to cause these things to fall down on the earth and have a devastating impact upon it during a period of time of seven years, which Daniel identifies the 70th week of Daniel as a time of God's judgment appointed specifically to the nation of Israel. Jesus speaks about that here, and he speaks about it, and he uses here in this passage of Matthew 24 the naming from Daniel chapter 9 of this important event, the abomination of desolation, which has not yet happened. Jesus' day, when Jesus was alive, he spoke of Daniel chapter 9 as yet future. When you see the abomination of desolation, and the cosmic disturbances of which I spoke uh, are listed here in this chapter in verses 29 down through verse 31. But I want you to notice, please, in verse 36, Jesus said, and I believe it was just so prominent in Peter's mind, Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So what did Jesus tell them to do? Verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. If you're watching, you won't be caught off guard. But if you're not watching, if you're disregarding and unaware of this truth, you will be caught off guard, just like when a thief comes in a home and the homeowner is not prepared. You are to be watching. And that's what Peter is saying. Watch. We're to be looking for these future events. Notice chapter 25. In the first 13 verses, Jesus used a parable, one of several. 
And this first parable is of the ten wise virgins and also, I'm sorry, ten virgins. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish, Matthew 25, verse 2. And what was the difference between the two? Well, they all went out to watch for the announcement of the bridegroom who was coming, but five of them had taken oil for their lamps and five of them did not. In other words, five were prepared and five were unprepared. And when the call came in the middle of the night that the bridegroom was coming, verse 6, and at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Well, the five virgins who had no oil asked the others, Give us some oil. They were not prepared. But the five virgins who had brought oil, they were prepared. And so that's the point. Are you prepared? Are you watching? And are you prepared for the events that God is going to bring and Jesus was talking about here as he referred to Daniel chapter 9? Notice verses 12 and 13 then. At the end of this parable, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. That's what he's going to say to the five foolish virgins who were not prepared. What was the substance of their lack of preparation? They had no relationship with God. They didn't have one. He will say to them, I do not know you. Now he had said to the virgins who were prepared, he brought them in. Verse 10, while they went to buy, that is the foolish virgins, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut leading to the situation that we just referred to in verse 12. So what's the point? Verse 13, the whole point is this. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so they were instructed to be watching for the Lord. And, and that's what Peter is saying here in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. Looking for the day of God. We'll identify that in just a moment. But notice also hastening. We are to be hastening the day of God. This word means to haste. Uh, but it can also mean earnestly desire. Now, this is interesting. Some people, when they come to this, 2 Peter 3, verse 12, and see the word hastening, they then insert things that are not said here in the text, and they take different ideas, and that is that if as a believer you're praying, if as a believer you're doing good works, if, if as a believer you're sowing the seeds of the gospel and people are getting saved, then you are bringing the Lord's return. You won't find that anywhere in the scriptures. This is a verse they try to use to make it say that. But that's not what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, if you look at, with me at Acts chapter 1, verse 7, the disciples, Peter being one of them on this occasion in Acts chapter 1, after Jesus' resurrection, when Jesus appeared to them for a period of about 40 days or so, uh, and he appeared to them and he showed himself alive from the dead, he also was instructing them and he was teaching them. We see in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, he was teaching them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And the disciples then were told in verse 6, when they had come together, they asked him, they asked Jesus saying, Lord, will you at this time right now restore the kingdom to Israel? Watch Jesus' answer in verse 7. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put, I want you to notice this word, in his own authority. The times and the seasons are in the authority of God. Now Daniel said this in Daniel chapter 2 when God gave a great vision to Nebuchadnezzar which outlined, just by way of outlining, not detailing time-specific stamps, but giving an outline of Gentile kingdoms, four of them with one, the fourth, being divided up into two different parts, and then a fifth kingdom, that is the kingdom of God, destroying all Gentile rule and authority to establish the kingdom of God, which according to Daniel chapter 2, the vision that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar, would last forever. It would take up the whole earth, and it would continue on forever. God as he revealed that to Daniel, Daniel prayed with his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, and spoke about how God appoints the times and the seasons. God does that. In his sovereign control is what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And so in that sense, you cannot hasten 
these events. You can't bring, we cannot by our human activity bring them to pass. That's not what the scriptures teach. If you come back with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, then the question rightfully, appropriately can be asked, well then what does Peter mean if we cannot bring these events to pass, they will come to pass in God's time? Should we, as some do, just say, well, God's going to do what God's going to do. It's going to happen when God happens it. I just need to take care of me, and that's all there is to that. I don't believe that's the right biblical attitude. There is an important meaning here. We're to be looking and watching but we're also to be hastening. Now remember, the word can also mean, hastening, earnestly desire. Earnestly desire these things. The Lord Jesus, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 2, when he taught his disciples to pray, he told them to pray in this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do you remember what the next phrase is that Jesus said? Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. He taught his disciples to pray that God would bring about his sovereign will and his plan and purposes. In other words, we are to be not only looking but anticipating and praying that God will bring forth his perfect will, his perfect plan, and that God was to do it in his timing. Well, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11, he talked about believers showing the love of God to one another, fulfilling the righteousness of God in our daily living, sowing the seeds of the gospel. He did talk about all those things, but he said it with these words in Romans 13, 11, and do this, specifically show love, and do this knowing the time. Do you know what time it is? Somebody got their watch out and said, yes, I, you're almost supposed to be done, Pastor. <laughs> no, I mean in God's plan of events. Do you know what time it is? We've looked at it together in our studies. John writes in 1 John, it's the last hour. We are in the time of which, even though it's been a long period of time, some 2,000 years, we're in a time that when it concludes... God is going back on a clock, as he revealed in Daniel chapter 9. And Jesus upbraided the people of Israel because they were not aware of their visitation, which is tied directly what's revealed in Daniel chapter 9 about the events that would take place on the nation of Israel. Seven years of what God revealed in Daniel chapter 9 have not yet happened. Jesus, as I just said, alluded to that seven-year period of time is yet future saying the abomination of desolation, which is included in Daniel chapter 9. That's what that's from. Do you know where we are? Do you know where the clock is ticking? And when the rapture of the church takes place and we are removed because it is not appointed for believers in this age to face the wrath of God, then God is going to turn his attention once again to the nation of Israel. And God is going to pour out his judgment upon all those who rebel against him and reject his son, Jesus Christ, so that his wrath will be poured out upon all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, as Paul says. Paul says, do this knowing the time that now, right now, in Paul's day, my day, right now, it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. We are hastening to the coming day of God, because every day that you live, we are moving closer to God's fulfillment of the events that he has revealed on the pages of scripture. And in that way, we are hastening. We are earnestly desiring and looking for God to bring about his will and his plan. Now, let's identify then what is the day of God, because we need to understand it's only the believer in Jesus Christ who can look forward to the plans of God with an expectation of comfort and joy. Only the believer. Because if you're an unbeliever, I want to tell you, you have no assurance until you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And apart from Jesus Christ who died for you, you have nothing to look forward to but the fearful judgment of God. Oh, I plead with you. We saw earlier in our study that today, right now, is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Right now is the accepted time. If you do not receive Jesus Christ to save your soul, you have nothing to look forward to but the pouring out of God's day 
of the Lord, which is a day of vengeance and judgment, leading to the day of God, leading to a new heavens and a new earth, according to what we see here in 2 Peter chapter 3. Well, the day of God, uh, this isn't going to help you, this won't be encouraging to you, but the day of God, this is the only time it's mentioned like this in Scripture right here. This is it. The day of God. This is not something that I can take you weaving through the Scriptures to look at 20 or 30 references. What is the day of God? This is the one. There's only one other reference, and it's a little bit different. It's called the day of Almighty God, that's in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. There, it's referring to the battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, and Armageddon is specifically named. Now, the battle of Armageddon is a part of the day of the Lord. Peter here, when he says the day of God, speaks about, he says, the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved. In other words, because the day of God takes place, all the present heavens and earth are going to pass away, verse 13, because God's going to bring forth a new heavens and new earth. Everything we need to know about identifying the day of God is given to us right here in this passage. The day of God is going to happen because of the destruction of the present heavens. I'm sorry, because of the day of God, it's going to bring about the destruction of the heavens and the earth that we presently live in and then bring in a new heavens and the new earth. And there is a passage of scripture at the very end of our Bible that with two little short phrases refer back to what Peter speaks about here in detail. All through verses 10 through 13, Peter's talking about this present heavens and earth passing away. And it's going to be a time of fervent heat, a great noise. Everything that's in the earth and the heavens, even the works, are all going to be burned up. Would you... Keep your finger here and turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Because of the day of God, then all this present heaven and earth is going to pass away, and then God will bring forth a new heavens and a new earth. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, God details, and I pointed out earlier, how these verses in chapter 19 into chapter 20 are all connected. Each verse with these connectives, each event sequentially happened, one connected to the next, connected to the next. And you'll notice that chapter 21 opens up with the word now. And in verse 2, the first word then. And in verse 3, the word and. Verse 4, the word and. Verse 5, the word then. Remember how we did that? Each verse is connected, just like Genesis chapter 1, a sequence of events. In verses 11 through 15 of chapter 20, we read about a great day of judgment, the great white throne judgment, verse 11, and him who sat on the throne, please notice, from whose face earth and heaven, did you notice the next word? Fled away. Now we might be tempted to just think of that metaphorically, we might be tempted to think of that just uh, in, in a symbolic way, that no one can stand before the face of the judge who's on the throne, and of course that's true, but I believe more is meant by it because as we open up chapter 21, verse 1, John writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. You can connect Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Come back now if you kept your finger there to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. There's going to be the day, the coming day of God, and because of that day of God, the heavens are going to be dissolved. And we read in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment is going to cause the heavens and the earth to flee and pass away. Chapter 21, then having passed away, God will bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. And in verse 13, Peter says, after speaking about this former heaven and earth passing away, he says, nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heavens and a new earth. Do you see how 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, the day of God, dovetails with Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, into chapter 21, into chapter 22, for that matter, the new heavens and the new earth. I submit to you, it is my understanding that the day of God here is referring to the judgment that takes place before and including the great white throne judgment. 
God's judgment, the day of God. It is a day of reckoning, a day when God will reckon with all souls who have rejected Jesus Christ. All the wicked and the sinners will one day have to stand before God. It is the day of that. All of this is going to pass away, this present universe in which we live. There'll be no more need of it. God's going to judge and he's going to bring forth what? A new heavens and a new earth. The day of God. The day of God's judgment. And the promise. Peter here speaks of a promise in verse 13. We, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth. That promise is given in Isaiah chapter 65. In verses 17, 17 and 18 in Isaiah 65, we read these words. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. For the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. That's what God says. Isaiah chapter 65. Peter is reflecting on the promise of God to bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. So, would you like to turn with me to Revelation chapter 21? And would you like to, with me for a moment, reflect with rejoicing the new heaven and the new earth? Listen to what God describes about this new heaven and a new earth in Revelation chapter 21. First of all, as we noted in verse 1 of chapter 21, the heaven and the earth that we presently live in are going to pass away. All of it. Peter says the fervent heat melt everything that's going to be destroyed in it. I, I want to tell you something. As I read those statements, I rejoice because of the way we pollute this present system. <laughs> I want to tell you the way we pollute it. We have nowhere. We don't know how to take care of the things we generate. Plastics and all these things we generate. And we bury them in the ground. And you know what? God knows how to take care of all of it. He's going to destroy this present universe, heavens and earth, and he's going to bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Former things have passed away. And so John also says in verse 2 now, Revelation 21 verse 2, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared for a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. He himself will be with them and be their God. So God is going to dwell together with mankind. Together. In harmony. How is that possible? Notice, God says in verse 6, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But then there's a list in verse 8. The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so nothing that is of sin, wickedness, and of God, ungodliness is going to enter into this new heavens and new earth, but will all reside in this lake that burns with fire and brimstone. That's the second death. So all the evil is going to be removed, and God is going to bring forth all those who are his children, those who have a relationship with God. How do you enter into a relationship with God? The word of God is so clear, it's through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Through faith we become the sons of God, Galatians 3, 26. But as many as received him, the word, Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Revelation 21, verse 7 says, those who overcome are the sons of God those who are part of his family, and that's through faith in God, through faith in Jesus Christ. Now go back to verse 4. Watch this description. We read, And God will wipe away every tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I dare say I've touched every single person who can hear my voice when I say that God, when he brings forth the new heavens and the new earth, which is going to be a place wherein righteousness dwells, 
that there's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any more suffering. There'll be no more sea. There'll be no more need for the sun and the moon. There'll be no more sorrow, no more crying. God's even going to take away the need for any tears. He'll remove them. Does that sound like a blessing? What a day of rejoicing God has prepared. And he goes on to describe in great details this new heaven and this new earth and the new Jerusalem that God is going to prepare. It's going to be a place of great light. It's going to be a place of great glory. Would you turn to the end of chapter 21 for me? Chapter 21 and verse 27, this chapter closes with these words. But there shall by no means enter into it, the new Jerusalem, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What a day that God has prepared for those who love him. And the day of God is going to bring about the ushering in of these events. God is going to have to judge all sin and sinners and that he might do away with this present heavens and earth, that he might bring forth a glorious new heaven and new earth. Wow. Uh, in the back of our hymnal, if you, uh, sorry, in the back of our bulletin, it's not in the hymnal, we have a little song. Uh, I've put it there for you. We're going to close our service with it this morning. It's called Heavenly Home. Heavenly Home. And just before we sing it, I want to read to you some of the words. No more hunger, no more thirsting, no more weeping, no more tears, no more sin, no more temptation, no more doubting, no more fears. Why? In that home the Lamb shall find them, he shall lead them in the way where the living fount is flowing and shall wipe all tears away. That's what God's going to do in his new heaven and new earth in his new Jerusalem, the city of glory. Notice in verse 3, no more weariness for pilgrims, no more restless tossings there, no more sorrow, no more sighing, no more watching, no more prayer. No more prayer? No. When we get to glory, we will see our Savior face to face. We shall be like him, for we shall see him face to face. No more need to watch in prayer. Every pilgrim's journey is ended. They have entered into rest, joys eternal, endless praises in that homeland of the blessed. I'm going to close our service in prayer this morning, and then we're going to sing this, and it's to the tune that we know so well, Come Thou Fount. We'll sing all three verses of it. But my heart's prayer is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. If not, I want to invite you, as I already have, to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He's our only hope. He's our only deliverance from the judgment of God, for he faced judgment on our behalf on the cross of Calvary, and he has laid up for us an eternity that is a beautiful eternity of God's glory and light. And all the hardships, pain, all the sickness, sorrow, and suffering of this present world would be done away. It would be a place of righteousness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God, because of it, there will be a passing away of the present heavens and earth, and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, oh, how our hearts long for that day of righteousness and glory. And we thank you for the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ who said, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Father, I pray if there are any this morning who, hearing my words, have been pricked to the heart, understanding that they need to turn from the life that they are living, turning from their own works and attempts to please you, to receive the gift of salvation that you have provided through Jesus Christ, I pray that you'll bless, strengthen, and encourage them. Lord, I pray for them not only, I pray for any who've heard my voice and do not know Jesus Christ and have not embraced this salvation, that Lord, you would bring upon them a spirit of repentance to recognize their lost condition and the judgment in their final end if they will not turn to Jesus Christ in salvation. And Father, I pray for your children who are pilgrims here going through this earthly life, seeking to honor you, watching, looking, waiting. Strengthen us with all might by your spirit in our inner man. 
And may we fix our gaze heavenward to the promise of your coming when Jesus Christ will one day eventually bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. O oh Lord, I pray that you would establish and encourage our hearts. I thank you for the promise of Jesus Christ to believers in this age that he went to prepare a place for us and that he's coming again to receive us unto himself that where he is we may be also. Lord, we are looking for the rapture the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who will receive us in the clouds of heaven to forever be with you. I pray that you'll strengthen the hearts of your children who are looking and who are seeking to be honest, to be faithful to you as we live day by day. I pray that you'll encourage each one and strengthen us. I pray with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.